Hey everyone, welcome to a good football show. I am Matt Straup. It is Thursday, July 7th, and today we're going to be taking a look at six players we're targeting in every July fantasy draft. To do this, I'm joined by Pat Corain, Lawrence Jackson, and Kyle Dvorak. And guys, I want to start with a little sports trivia today. I actually have no idea whether this will be super easy or if it's going to be a stumper. But the question is, which major sport has its draft beginning tonight? It's got to be hockey. I know. Got to be hockey. Yeah, it's I know. Be hockey. On Twitter, people gotta have been be grinding hockey props. But uh, yeah. could I tell you any? Could I name a single player in the draft? Could I tell you who's taking top oh, three? I, no. I was well, about to say, don't start asking for no players because they didn't. Well, you guys unlocked the bonus content, though. I mean, you guys all got it. You guys all said got to be. I like the phrasing got to be hockey by all three of you. I, I like I like the, <laughs> It wasn't was any you. intelligence the of hockey. It was just, uh, you know, process of elimination got us yeah. to hockey. Because I know roughly yeah. you in the NBA draft is obviously we know what NFL is. Uh, it could have been baseball. Honestly, if you were like, oh, they hold the draft in the middle of the season because it's baseball and they still do things like they do. The 50s, yeah. I would have believed that. So it is yeah, true. Was. They do. Um but you did, as I said, you unlocked the bonus content. This is the extra credit question. Whoever buzzes in first, you'll each get one shot. Which team holds the first overall pick in the NHL draft? I joked about this, but I actually do think I know the answer. I'll let everyone else go first. Buzz in, please. You, Pat, you, you guys, I, I'm pretty sure I know the right answer. If no one else wants to take a guess, don't I'm gonna go with allowed. The, I'm, Blue I'm going to go with right? the Los Angeles Kings. X, uh, Kyle, and... Eh. Corain, no. you got one? Pittsburgh Penguins. No, eh, it's the Montreal Canadiens hold the number one. Oh, pick. they oh, are pretty Montreal. bad, aren't they? Yeah. They no, I did say bad. the Penguins because I, I knew they were a team. And, you know, the, hey, the, the goal like is not to bear self by, by saying not a team. I could have said the Flyers, the, but I feel like if the hurt. criteria was a team, then you get a ding ding. So, I mean, everyone, <laughs> everyone <laughs> selected a team. So I will give you credit for that. <laughs> All right. We're moving on. We're moving on from hockey. Uh, we're going to start things off with some recent NFL news. That being the news from Wednesday that Baker Mayfield has been traded to the Panthers for a conditional fifth round pick. Karain, we'll start with you. We'll just hear from everyone on this. How, if at all, does this change the dynamics and the outlook of this Carolina offense for you? Does it even matter? Yeah, it does. Fantasy wise? It does. Sam Darnold was so bad last season. Uh, Matt Corral, I think, is is pretty interesting in terms of like just not being Sam Darnold, but there's also a pretty low floor to what he could bring to the offense. Cause all we care about is can you support Christian McCaffrey and DJ Moore? Like we don't mm -hmm. need a quarterback who can also support Robbie Anderson. There's no tight end that we care about in this, on this team at all. Terrace Marshall is like an 18th round total flyer right now. So it just comes down to DJ Moore. And I think Baker Mayfield has a much bigger chance of being able to support him uh, in a similar way to how Jarvis Landry had pretty solid seasons with Baker Mayfield a couple years ago. He was over two yards per out mm -hmm. run uh, with Baker. So we can get DJ Moore to that level, get a huge target share from him, and then, you know, dump offs to McCaffrey on top of that. And all of a sudden we have a, a functional fantasy offense. Yeah, the good news is, like, I like this for fantasy. Like, like we said, I, I don't think... Uh, this will be where the bad news kind of starts is I don't like uh, acquiring the like 18th to 25th best quarterback right as far as a franchise move because it's it's really right. just sort of trying to off put the inevitable bottoming out, which is what you want. You want to eventually find your next Justin Herbert or whatever. You want to find that guy once. No, exactly. That's the thing is like I. It's short-sighted, right? It's Matt Rule saying like, oh God, I really need seven wins this year. And you don't project yeah. for seven wins with Sam Darnold. You just don't. Now, right. maybe you do. It certainly gets you closer. And like <laughs> like Pat said, I don't think Baker is that good, but I think people may be underselling between Baker and Darnold. Baker's ranks in EPA per play since he ended the league, they ended the league at the same time, 21st, 8th, 23rd, 18th. Like I said, he probably falls right around player 20. And two years ago, he was actually a very solid quarterback. Darnold, 28th, 32nd. There are only 32 Ooh. teams, if you remember, 27th and 30th. His best season is not even close to Baker Mayfield's worst season. So this is very good for the offense because it goes yeah. from being the potential to be literally the worst offense in the NFL to I think it'll be competent. And that's all like you look at like McCaffrey and DJ Moore's really good yeah. finishes. They weren't on good offenses. They were on barely competent offenses. And this clears that bar. Now, if I was a fan of the Panthers, like 
all their like this is just Matt Rule trying to to save face for one final season, get me right. to the next year. But it's just like clawing at life as he's drowning because he's not a particularly good coach. And I don't know, maybe this does save him. That's not really what you want. You don't want to be saved to go eight, eight and what is it now eight and nine every year. You don't want that. Right. You want to like find out if Matt Corral is good or you want to get top three in yeah. the draft next year. So as a franchise, I find this to be like almost a cowardly move as uh, fantasy uh, wow. opinions. I love DJ Moore and I'm excited it's, about DJ Moore. Yeah. It's never cowardly to not start Sam Darnold. I, I think it's fine. Uh, it's no, fifth round pick. It, it's fifth no. round pick. See, see if Baker can recover. It's fine. <laughs> we said this last year with Sam Darnold. I get that Sam Darnold is much worse. I understand that. But like. But they sent a second for Darnold, didn't they? It, yes, Baker's I agree. This is, they literally, Baker's paying the part of his own salary. He took a pay cut. Browns are covering some of it. I think it's a totally, totally fine move for the Panthers. I think this is a bad move for the Panthers. I, I think Lawrence. you want to get, I want, it's a race to the bottom as early as possible. Like what is, what is the good outcome here? The, Baker, Baker's probably not a top five quarterback. He's probably not a top 10 quarterback. The best case scenario is he gets to like fringe top 10 and then you pay him like Kirk Cousins money, right? Then Or Derek Carr money. And you're just saddled with a good quarterback who's got a bloated contract. Like that is the good outcome that Baker turns things around and you're paying a guy at market prices for quarterbacks that are in the mid tier are insane. You're paying him more money than it ends up being valuable to you. And that's the good outcome. The, the bad outcome is he's like 20. He's exactly who he's been. And you get eight wins and no quarterback. And you reset again. You just keep resetting, resetting, resetting. I think this is a dumb move for a franchise unless you were looking at a one year window. Yeah, uh, Matt Rue, that boy out here fighting for his life right now. Yeah. Um, and, we, and you just kind of alluded to it, you know, he brought back Cam Newton at some point last year, and Cam Newton started games in the yeah. middle of the season, mm -hmm. right? Before that, it was Teddy Bridgewater. Then you got Sam Darnold. Now it's Baker Mayfield. Man, fight for his life. Actually, one, we, we need to pour out one for my boy P.J. Walker one time. God like, bless. He even started some games last year for the Panthers, and now it seems yeah. that he's all but out of this little quarterback competition that they're going to have which is a weird thing to say, you know, you bringing in Baker. Now you didn't have to give up much to get him because Cleveland Browns backs was up against the wall. So you didn't have to right. give up much. You giving them backup money pretty much. Um, but you have him here for a reason. So he, he gonna start. It'll be crazy if he doesn't, um, that make the move look even worse. Um, from a fantasy perspective though, I do think, uh, if people were on the fence about DJ Moore, this should kind of get him over the hump just simply because Baker Mayfield is better than uh, Sam Darnold. Uh, you, you know, you won't have Baker Mayfield in the first three weeks rushing for five touchdowns like Sam Darnold did, taken away from the players, you know, that we care about DJ Moore and Christian McCaffrey. We won't have that with Baker. Uh, Baker will give him a chance to, you know, uh, open up the offense a, a, a little more than Sam Darnold. And again, this ain't saying much. Um, I'm more leaning towards the side of, you know, Kyle saying it, it's a bad move because you just put in a Band-Aid on it, you know, when you need to go ahead and get the surgery. Um, and where does this leave Matt Corral now? Like, you picked him up in the third round. I mean, he better be part of this quarterback competition. You know, he got to be part of it, right? So, But, but at the end of the day um, – you know, it, it, it'll help DJ more a little bit fantasy wise. Christian McCaffrey was going to do what he was going to do regardless. Um, So we, we're just going to have to live with that. We'll be OK with that. Mm -hmm. And the fact that Robbie Anderson will not be retiring now. You guys are right, of course, that this is a this is a bad move from like a long term strategic planning. But I mean, we're not going to have to watch Sam Darnold, guys. I mean, it, it's a great move I, yeah. for the Panthers. Yeah, thank sure, you, thank sure. you, thank you. We're not gonna yeah. have to watch Sam. Darnold. I agree. You don't want to watch oh. Sam Darnold play. Uh, when I, I I'm thinking of you, really have to take your medicine now to reap the rewards long term. But also, uh, none of us are fans that I know of of the Panthers. So for the general viewing public, this probably is better. This is better it's for society though. in general. Yeah, it's better for yeah. society. I did want to ask, uh, where do you guys think DJ Moore's ADP settles? He's still wide receiver 17 on underdog. That'll they'll be moving up pretty quickly. But uh, where do you think he ultimately settles in? Like been kind of a three four turn guy do you think he eventually moves up to that like mike williams kind of early third range 
I'd be surprised if he gets up quite that far. People still don't like Baker. They still have a, and he's not that good. Like I read off his like EPA stats. He, he's like the 20th best quarterback. Uh, I, I don't, I think people underperceive how much of an upgrade this is uh, going from maybe the worst quarterback in the league to the 22nd or whatever. I think that's like a pretty substantial upgrade. So I, I think he'll probably only move up maybe like four or five wide receiver spots. Like, you know, to, I guess that'd be pretty much close to where you're saying. I'd say maybe like three or four spots still behind like the Mike Williams type of tier, but I guess probably not yes that'd probably be right around yeah. where I put him, yeah. okay so disastrous roster management in real life but we'll take the fantasy wins where we can get them and especially given uh given the nature of this podcast so that's where we land there meanwhile one other piece of news before we get into players we're targeting in july and that is that the athletics nate taylor considers ronald jones a quote legit candidate to earn the chief starting job over clyde edwards elayer corain I do feel like I have to go back to you here first as well, given that you are the resident Rojo expert and enthusiast of this group. Enthusiast for sure. Uh, so I actually had a new shift this morning, saw this and did not blurb it. So I, I now feel like I'm going to get reprimanded here at NBC for not wow. blurbing about Rojo since wow. uh, Rotopat came in and scooped that blurb up. Uh, they did say that he has a legit chance to be a starter if he has an exceptional camp. So I uh, I was like, this feels borderline. <laughs> I should probably break ties against delivering about Rojo, given my uh, my history of hyping Rojo. So yeah, uh, that was actually not me, um, but it was fun Allegedly. to read that blurb. I will say, yeah. I didn't. I, I saw the headline. I didn't see that he has to have an exceptional camp to uh, take over. That's uh, that that would have been like my intuition though. Is that Clyde Edwards-Helaire has like the incumbent and first round pick sort of baked into his uh, valuation from the team, and Rojo has like what's his contract? I think it's like one year, one point two or five million. Like not far off of the vet men for a single season. Not very highly valued by the team in literal dollars they spent on him. So, yeah, it would require like a more a continuation of the implosion of Clyde edwards Hilaire and an exceptional camp from Rojo for week one starter status. So I think when you're drafting right. Rojo, you're not like if he doesn't start week one, this is a busted pick. You don't need him to start week one. You're hoping that he gets on the field for some snap, maybe like seven, eight carries, yeah. splits a little bit of work week one. And as Clyde edwards Hilaire continues to look like Clyde edwards Hilaire has looked for two years, then by week five, six, et cetera, you get yeah. your Rojo. You don't need him to be. A, a, and you're hoping you know, for touchdowns. Stuff. In between there, like he, he yep. gets in the end zone week one, falls into the end zone, um, you know, for your best ball portfolio. He he might get enough touchdowns in those early weeks to, to help you out a little bit. Yeah, say you've drafted, you know, 30, 40, 50 percent of him and most of your financial outcome for the next 12 months is riding on him. You, you'd like a week one, two, three, four and five touchdowns. For sure. All all of these Chiefs running backs, Clyde Edwards, Larry, Jerry McKinnon, uh, Ronald, Ronald, I was about to say Mick Jones. Uh, <laughs> I kind of Jones. like all of these oh, like mcdonald's guys they'll give Loves us the their, hamburglar <laughs> they're gonna give us their best football in a committee and uh that's probably how it's gonna be anyway i mean me personally i am uh i am i would rather draft ronald jones a few rounds later than a clyde edwards lair uh mm-hmm. mainly because we done seen what clyde edwards lair uh has done and what he probably will do uh in this Chiefs offense. So I, I would take that I, I would rather take him at that price than uh than uh CEH. Uh Pat, do you have are you getting much Jarrett McKinnon? Because I find myself like if you don't like Clyde Ards Hilaire, which I know you don't uh he's a perfectly fine person in front of the podcast Clyde Ards Hilaire, but he hasn't you know done the things the Chiefs want to do in the field. Uh it feels like the natural fit to play the Daryl Williams role in which I guess we're kind of crafting on a Clyde or Tlair. The natural fit could be a player like uh, McKinnon. Are, are you getting much McKinnon? I find myself still kind of nabbing him up every now and then the back ends of, of best ball drafts, you know, the deeper rosters. I am drafting McKinnon. He falls pretty late sometimes. Sometimes you'll see someone come in and swoop in and get him in like the 14th or 15th, but he'll also fall to the 17th, 18th round in some drafts. Um, it does not, He's not like on everyone's radar, it feels like. So you can get really cheap McKinnon. I love getting him there. I've taken him with Rojo because uh, I, I think you're just – right. you're betting against CEH, and I think a, a post-CEH – like CEH just gets like benched. Yeah. It would be Rojo and McKinnon. Like Rojo's mm-hmm. not going to take over the backfield. You're, you're betting on long runs, occasional screen passes, and touchdowns with Rojo. 
you're betting on dump off passes with Jerick McKinnon. So they can get there together and at their price tags, I mean, you know, you're taking one in the eleventh, one in the sixteenth, let's say. That's so cheap. I think it's fine to draft both. So uh, I'm not doing that like all the time, but I've done it. And I also just like getting McKinnon separately. If you're trying to backdoor stack that game, he's he's helpful. Like if you have Mahomes, he's makes more sense in some ways to add than uh than Roger does. Quickly, do we still like McKinnon? Are we intrigued by him in season long leagues as well, or is that more of a best ball play for you guys? I am. I mean, he's so cheap. Um, I took him actually just took him in a dynasty league where it's a uh, it's kind of a shallow league where okay. you're going to end up having to make cuts and stuff. But th- that's not a best ball league. So if we put him in, we're going to have to select him. But I think there could be a scenario where Ceh sees a reduction in playing time that's predictable, and so now <laughs> you're you're looking at like a McKinnon role that's similar to what he had in the playoffs. Yeah. That's a guy where you could plug him in as a starter. Is it just me or did he not look great in the playoffs? Like I test awesome. wise, did, did he, he not look fantastic? Like the guy's a, an electric player. Yeah. I mean, that's what we've been waiting to see for so long. We've been waiting like, uh, you know, for, for these sicko dynasty bag holders who are like, I can't cut him. Have you seen his combine from 2005? Like I can't, I can't be cutting this guy. He actually looked like that, you know, explosive playmaking guy who can catch passes. He looked finally yeah. back to Jarek McKinnon that we saw like in Minnesota so long ago. So yeah, he's like fringe final roster spot in your like standard redraft league. That's perfectly mm-hmm. viable. All right, so on a recent episode, our crew talked about names were hesitant to draft. That included A.J. Brown and Antonio Gibson. So go check that out if you haven't done so already. Today, we're doing the opposite. These are players we're targeting in every draft for July. We've got six of them. We're going to go around the room here, starting with you, Lawrence. Hit us with your first player. Well, I'm going to go uh, straight to the ATL. My boy, Kyle Pitts, I am drafting him every single time in the third round. I don't care if it's the first pick of the third round. If it's the last pick of the third round, then I'm lucky. Um, (laughs) This could potentially be the last time uh, you get Kyle Pitts in the third round before he goes on a year's streak of being drafted where Travis Kelsey has been drafted uh, for so long. Um, And and remember, he's still fresh out of childhood. This man is only 21 years old, right? We see the picture of Lamar Jackson looking all swole, right? Imagine Kyle Pitts when he's 25 years old, right? By that time, we'll be talking about him. Man, should we draft him in the end of the first round, second round? That's how we're going to be talking about Kyle Pitts. So right now, man, especially with uh, with all the with with the value we have at um, running back in the you know fourth, fifth, sixth round with guys like uh Zeke Saquon ETN um I had no problem starting out with uh Kyle Pitts in that third round uh if I was to get two receivers to start off my draft and then go with Kyle Pitts to solidify that tight end position I got to have him every draft every third round I love this one uh was was sniped on this you know, as, as a <laughs> this is good because you and draft. I both like are very eligible to choose Kyle Pitts. When you and I get on the show, we talk about Kyle Pitts a lot. It's like a yeah. you know, it's like Ronald yeah. Jones for you or doing a Jay Lono impression for other Pat. It's just something that comes up a lot in our conversation. So it's good right. that we get literally anyone else to talk about him because I think n- neither you nor me will be disagreeing with this at all. Yeah, and no, Lawrence no. had a very very quick reply on the email uh, by Lawrence to yeah, land like Kyle very Pitts. quick. Yeah, and I was I, I saw your prompt Matt and I was like, oh Kyle Pitts, obviously. And then like uh he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> it was brutal. Got him. I mean Kyle Pitts, Kyle Pitts. <laughs> the thing that's crazy about Kyle Pitts is like I'm totally fine taking him in the early third, but you can get him sometimes he'll fall to the early fourth in these Bethel Mania drafts. Like I've I've been scooping him a lot like it's actually changed what I, I mentioned this on the show it's changed the way i've approached some of the other tight ends like because i know i can get pits or at least i have a very good chance to get pits in the late third these days um mm-hmm. and i just think he's such a great pick there uh he it's interesting he was not that high among the tight ends uh who in terms of their uh snap rate from the slot but that's mm-hmm. because he had 34 percent of his snaps from out wide so it's like you know normally yeah. we're like talking about these guys playing out of the slot you don't really ever see a tight end playing a third of his snaps just out wide because he's actually a wide receiver, which Kyle Pitts is. Uh, and he's a very, very efficient wide receiver at that. Last year, uh, he had over 1.9 yards per out run. 
joining Zach Ertz, Rob Gronkowski, Mark Andrews, and Jordan Reed uh, as the only rookie tight ends with 50-plus targets to hit that mark. So I completely agree with Lawrence. This could be the last time that you're taking him uh, beyond the second round for uh, for many years. And just to add on to that, uh, before we move on, um, I mean, that stat line is a rookie, 68 catches, 1,026 yards, one touchdown. I mean, I think if with a little more touchdown luck, like you wouldn't even be able to get him in the third round, right? I mean, if it was five touchdowns, oh, six sure. a rookie, Definitely. which is a reasonable number. I mean, he had it for, for his skill set. It's a really fluky number, the one touchdown. So if he just, has yeah. seven touchdowns as a rookie, he'd probably be the first tight end taken off the board this year. But – yeah. He saved us. We could still get him in the third for <laughs> Matt for Ryan saved year. us. That's right. Yeah, Matt Ryan. Matt Ryan, yeah, Matt Ryan saved us. <laughs> All right. Let's move to player number two on the list. And Kyle, you are up next uh, with your first guy. Yeah, first guy, Aaron Jones. I, I find myself uh and, and like Pat said, knowing that I can take Aaron Jones, I'm comfortable taking him at the turn, like literally like 11, 12, whereas like an underdog mm-hmm. is at like 17 right now. I mean, like, he has been, given his elite receiving profile, I'm not really concerned about the bottom out, right? For even, like, we talked about Joe Mixon a few weeks ago. Like, there's a legit chance he run bad on touchdowns with Joe Mixon, and he's not a particularly good pass catcher. He's the bare minimum of a guy you put out on passing downs. And if they like what they see from the guys behind him, maybe they'll just go away. And then you run bad on touchdowns, and then you have a dreadful season. Then you have a season that really is crushing your team. I think with the receiving profile of Aaron Jones – it would really be surprising if he has a season that crushes your team, where on the other hand, there are so many outcomes now that we don't have Devontae Adams, where mm-hmm. either the running game as a whole, which wouldn't surprise me, or the passing game likely via Aaron Jones, or at least more probably via Aaron Jones, both feature Aaron Jones as essentially the centerpiece of the offense. And we only have, you know, eight games to look, but without Devontae Adams, I mean, not Devontae mm-hmm. Adams, he does the borderline Alvin Kamara thing. He averages six targets yeah. a game nearly 50 receiving yards his receiving touchdowns get a get a pretty notable bump as well and he's up to 23 ppr points per game in eight games without Devontae adams a small sample i think you can kind of in the offseason plan a little bit more for life without Devontae adams than you can in mid-season you're kind of like i guess we just throw it to aaron jones a bunch but they didn't really take i mean you know christian watson and like Dobbs. The, the, they took guys who don't really seem to fill the Devontae Adams void almost in the slightest, and Sammy Watkins doesn't do that. So it might just be they're planning the offseason as if they're in season. Oh, guess we just have to focus on Aaron Jones. He doesn't even need to be the focal point of the backfield if he's, like, as far as running backs go, the focal point of the passing attack. So yeah, I am very sort of lenient with how I play. Like, I can go Kelsey, I can go another running back, I can go receiver. I don't have, like, a strong positional allocation if I'm able to take Aaron Jones at picks 12, 13, you know, through, like, 17, where he goes. I haven't been drafting a ton of Aaron Jones. Um, I don't don't mind it, but it's just, like, I I like Z – or not Z. I like Saquon. (laughs) I don't like Z. I like Saquon better um, there, and and he feels like a guy – that the ADP is going to move up on considerably. Um, and it kind of already has. So like, if I'm still, if I get Zeke to fall in that range, I take him um, kind of last call for him, probably uh, on Saquon. I mean, um, but then flip that off. Karain loves Zeke. Can we add him yeah. I don't know why he keeps saying Zeke. I guess the he's, running, he's I'm talking Zeke about a running back. Right? I like drafting. I, just, I almost mentioned Zeke as the Joe Mixon parallel where like the receiving falls off. And he doesn't get touchdowns. It's that bottom out. So I think maybe that profile is on your mind. Yeah, it might be. Uh, but also the receiving talent in that range is interesting. Like Debo going there, uh, I don't know. It feels like there's a little bit of a discount still with Debo because of the stuff with the trade. And I, I, mm-hmm. I basically don't think anything's happening there. So um, I don't know. I, I'm taking a lot of receivers in that range as well, which is keeping me off Aaron Jones. But I, I like the bull case. I, I ain't t- taking a lot of Aaron Jones either, but I probably should. Um, for the reason that, you know, uh, you, you mentioned there, Kyle, uh, Devontae Adams. And I don't mm-hmm. think one, obviously one receiver ain't about to just come in and just replace what he was and what he did for the team. It's going to be a collective effort for one between them receivers. But then at the end of the day, um, at the end of the day, your best playmaker has to have the ball in his hands. And that's what you're going to try to do. Now that Devontae Adams is gone, as we sit here today, um, outside of his uh, left tackle, Aaron Rodgers doesn't trust anybody more on that offense right now. 
uh, then and Eric Jones. Uh, I expect, his, especially if we talking a uh, full PPR here, that's where an Aaron Jones uh, will have his will have his most value. Um, I don't know if I take him at the end of the first, but uh, I, I don't see how you you know how you can scoff at that in in the second round. Uh, at the end of the first, it just depends on how it how it falls to you and how people in your leagues are drafting. You may end up with uh, you know justin jefferson at the end of the first round and, and you're gonna smash that uh pat used the comparison to saquon barkley i would wait another round round and a half whatever you want to call it i would wait that time to get saquon uh instead of aaron jones uh just because you know it's you know, this is his cheapest saquon ever been um and he and he's not gonna be sharing a backfield like aaron jones is but uh, definitely ain't mad at Aaron Jones, man. He proved it year in and year out. We keep waiting on him to fall off, and it never happened. Uh, he just and now that Devontae Adams is gone, uh, it, it's really gonna be his show. Yeah, I do so like I got- that you mentioned. I like that you mentioned Justin Jefferson because uh, I, I love Justin Jefferson. I'm taking him as much as I can, and I even find myself taking a lot of Dalvin Cook. And you know the similarity between these two is that they play for Minnesota. And if you know anything about best ball, uh, Week 17 is important. And if you know anything about uh, if you're sick, if you're have a diseased brain where you cannot look yeah. at anything other than Week 17 correlations, they play yeah. none of them. The Green Bay Packers in Week 17. <laughs> so I've I've set up both Dalvin Cook and Justin Jefferson plus Aaron Jones snacks more than I can count. I like that. Yeah, I, I got to get I have I actually knew, a lot of I Jefferson, knew. so I got to get some Jones tacked on. But I, I have a question. It's quite pertinent here. Uh, I'm in one of the early main event drafts, FFPC main event, and out of the 105, got Jamar Chase. This is a tight end premium league, PPR, uh, and point and a half for tight ends. Comes back around. The decision is Kyle Pitts, and the, run, the last major running back there is Aaron Jones. So what would you guys have done in that situation? I think I would take Kyle Pitts in a tight end premium. I love Aaron Jones, but I also love Kyle Pitts. This isn't uh, – I don't cancel. I'm not going back on my word. this tight end premium, I would have to go tight uh, – I'm sorry. I would have to go Kyle Pitts right there because you, you're you going to get him the next round in non-tight end premium. So I, I will go Kyle Pitts right yeah, there. It feels like – exactly. It feels like you are not having to pay that much of the tight end premium given how comfortable you said you would take him like, you know, first half of the third round. Yeah, the back yeah. half of the second or middle of the second really isn't like that much of a tight end premium for the price you were willing to pay already. That's how it felt to us. We're like, we're getting the premium for free. So we took Kyle Pitts. There you go. That's fine. All right. Player number three, Karain, this is your first guy. And I believe it's uh, one uh, quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers. Is that where you're going to start? That is correct, uh, Matt. That's uh, Trey Lance. Trey Lance is our... <laughs> I like to First let you say the name. I don't know why. I don't know why. <laughs> I feel like I'm stealing your thunder if I if I say the name. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, yeah, Trey Lance kind of feels like last call here for Trey Lance. I've been drafting a bunch of Trey Lance uh, in June. I mean, he was, uh, he's one of these guys where you look at your exposures and you go, oh, okay, do you need more? And then you go, yeah, I do. I, I do need more. But, uh, but you do have to think about it real quick. Uh, yeah, Trey Lance, I think he's still, for some reason, being held down by – a little bit is ADP by Jimmy Garoppolo still being on the San Francisco 49ers. And like Jimmy Garoppolo is the shout out of the stadium. He's not practicing. Uh, he's, I mean, I don't know that he would be practicing anyway because of this shoulder thing, but uh, he's like not with the team. And ultimately he might get cut if they can't trade him. Uh, obviously they have one less place to trade him now with Baker in Carolina, but it does feel like eventually Trey Lance's ADP is going to move into the early seventh, Maybe he even gets into the late sixth. He does still sometimes fall into the eighth round. If you look at what he did last year in terms of his rushing rates, it's like really hard not to project him for an absurd amount of rushes. His rushing percentage in terms of designed runs per drop back, he was at over 31% design runs per drop back, which is off the charts obviously they're bringing him in for some packages and stuff like that's not going to hold up but like lamar jackson over the last three years was at 23 and a half so it's like he can he can considerably decline and still be kind of at a lamar jackson type of level um i wouldn't necessarily project him to be quite as high as that but i think he could be around that range he also scrambles a lot 
He scrambled on 14% of his dropbacks, which Lamar Jackson's been at 10% over the last three seasons. So again, like there's going to be regression. He's not going to have that level of scrambling, but he might, he might scramble as much as Lamar on top of a bunch of designed rushes. So just having that kind of level of rushing performance um, in, you know, uh, most of these formats really do reward the rushing quarterback. That's how you're going to have the, the kind of weak breaking types of scores from your quarterback position to get him as kind of like almost past the tier of guys that really have that upside. Like, you know, you're kind of getting him sometimes after a Brady, right. After Dak, who doesn't really have that level of a ceiling as a rusher. Uh, I think it's, it's pretty enticing and it's probably going away. Like he's ultimately he's going, it's going to be very clear in a month or two that he is going to be the week one starter. He's going to start the entire season. And at that point, I think people are going to go like, do I want him? Like, you know, how many picks am I going to wait after Jalen Hurts goes off the board? One, two, like, mm-hmm. you know, you might, you might see him go ahead of Burrow sometimes. So I think uh, uh-huh. this discount's drying up pretty quick. Yeah. I like the, the Lamar Jackson comp because we got seven games of Lamar Jackson as a rookie and uh, he, he ran, this is unreal in seven games. He, you know, he got some reps for this. I'm sure he came in the middle of one game, but essentially, you know, Take 10 off the top. Take 100 yards off the top. 147 carries, 695 yards, and five touchdowns in under half a season. And the next year was like, he's not really going to run that much, is he? And the answer, like Crane said, was no, technically he will not run at that extent. You can't double his numbers given he played about half season. But he will probably have some of the highest rushing stats of any quarterback in the NFL. Like you, you can understandably scale back the rushing from the very limited sample we got. But, you know, there is still going to be massive numbers. And that proved to be true. It was like, oh, how high can we draft Lamar Jackson? He's not going to rush that much. And then he basically, I think he set all the records for rushing quarterbacks, both attempts and yards. And it wasn't even close. And it was a great season. And I think that's at least the almost the starting point of Trey Lance is essentially he is like, a, you know, a, a small underdog to lead all quarterbacks in like rush attempts, yards, like, like Jalen Hurts was last year. If Lamar gets hurt, mm-hmm. then it's basically down to like Hurts and Trey Lance. And, and or if Lamar just scales back his numbers, you have like two to three guys who can really threaten like 900 yards or something. It's very rare. And he's one of them. And that is just the freest, like it's like juiced ball stuff where it's like the scoring system just wasn't designed, you know, fantasy in the nineties wasn't yeah. designed to account for Trey Lance just running for a thousand yards. Maybe he's not that good. Fantasy doesn't care. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the thing I'd be thinking about with Trey Lance is because I've thought about like, Hey man, what if this dude go out here rush for 700 yards? Like, who is he like somebody has to somebody got to suffer for that um because you know <laughs> the people who don't draft him the people who don't draft him is that yeah about? yeah oh, that's it oh yeah yeah, yeah i assume you mean that someone's gonna pay i assume you mean the carries and lack of targets suffer as yes. well some like george kittle debo uh definitely elijah mitchell um uh, mm-hmm. would, would would suffer in that in in that fashion, we saw Jalen Hurts lead the league in rushing yards for quarterbacks last season with 784 yards. And we saw Miles Sanders have the worst rushing year of his career. So if, if Trey Lance does, you know, get around those numbers in the rushing department, in the passing department, I honestly could say I, I don't even know what he's going to do. When it gets to that point in, in some of these drafts, uh, you know, you either all the way in on Trey Lance or you just ain't messing with him. And I'm talking about like after Derek Carr and Matthew Stafford type dudes. Um, For me personally, um, man, I don't know. I feel like I'm waiting and it's not like I even have to wait, but it's like I'm waiting for Jimmy G to get cut. So I could just mm-hmm. be like, all right, now. Yeah. Now we can see what's going on. You and everybody else, Lawrence. You gotta, you gotta get, yeah. get him while he's cheaper. He's I'm, gonna I'm move shook, up around I'm that. Shook with that. When, before I actually, you know, got to this point in my um, fantasy football working career, um, entering the 2009 season, I was like Lamar Jackson, Lamar Jackson, Lamar Jackson. Like he, like Kyle said, he ran for almost 700 yards in seven starts. I'm like. That clearly shows you he's going to rush for 1,000 yards. Um, so I'm beating the table for Lamar Jackson. 
I'm just not beating the table for Trey Lance like that. And I'm going to be one of those people who suffers <laughs> when he rushes for 800 yards and he ends that week 16 or week 17 fantasy championship game against me. He going to run for like 100 yards, throw for like 200, and I'll be, you know, I had the L on my face because I was thinking too much. Well, Someone, Lawrence, what a, what a plot twist. Lawrence said someone's going to suffer, and it ended up being him. I did not yeah. see that yeah, twist that coming. That is very cool. Either. Yeah, that's uh, like yeah, a Shyamalan-esque yeah. twist. <laughs> yeah. I do want to, uh, you know, the, the point there, Lawrence, about your, uh, you know, maybe a George Kittle or um, Debo or IU kind of suffering because there's not going to be as many passing attempts. I actually think that's maybe one of the reasons why Lance's rise could be very quick in these best ball drafts is because, like, you don't have to have a big stack around Trey Lance. Like if you want to, especially because he's going right, right next to Brandon Ayuk right now, but if he kind of okay. gets far enough ahead, you can go Lance and then try to get Ayuk after. If you have Kittle, you can get Lance. You can go naked Lance and then tack on like a Tyrion Davis price is a bet that the offense kind of rolls. Or you just truly don't stack Lance because it's just a bet that he runs an absurd amount of times and he doesn't really have to bring anybody along with him that particular week because the rest of the offense is a little bit pricey. So, I, it, you know, unlike maybe a, a quarterback like Burrow or Stafford or Brady, where you really would like to have stacking partners with them, there's not going to be as as much of a, a pushback on his ADP because I think people will be comfortable single stacking him or, or even just having him alone. Karain, so, do you have an opinion on who will not uh, within the offense, who will suffer? Because I kind of agree. Like you look at the, like the Lamar Jackson teams, the Jalen Hurts teams, and you're not getting like three 1,000 yard receivers. Even when he's super efficient, you're really betting on touchdowns. And I don't think, I, I don't think, I, I know for sure we're not going to get like the 9% touchdown rate that we got in Lamar Jackson's breakout years. It's just one of the most efficient seasons yeah. we've ever seen for a quarterback. It, I think maybe Lance could be an efficient passer he will not be that level of productive because few quarterbacks have ever been. So you, you think like just a uh, process of elimination at some point, the offense can't look like it did last year when you insert Lance into the lineup. Uh, to me, I kind of just default to Brandon Ayuk because I think he is many rungs in talent level below Debo and, and below George Kittle who are like Kittle's maybe the best player at his position and Debo for the first eight weeks was like leading the league in target share. He was up there in air yard share. He truly was like an alpha number one receiver. And at that time, we were getting Brandon Ayuk splitting snaps with, I assume, like Trent Sherfield or something. Like they literally just Oof. doghoused him. Yeah. He's better than that. But like the fact they're willing to do that to him, I think the talent differential is massive. And it could look like uh, the Ravens did last year, where wide receiver one, big spike weeks, very high ceiling, tight end, basically the same argument. And no one, the map is just dead after that. In in redraft, I, where would you go with him, Pat? It, would you yeah. like? Would you wait on a quarterback and then select him as your QB one and one quarterback yeah. lead? Yes. Yeah, I think that's great. Yeah, I, I think. I mean, the way they've handled this Garoppolo stuff is not the way you would handle a guy who's going to play for you this season. They are <sighs> they traded up for Lance last yeah. year. They. He was. He's going to start for them. Like, I, yeah, obviously, like, guys get hurt. G not even to worry no more. That's not even a, yeah. that. That that's mm -hmm. clear. It's and, just that he there lingering. That's. I don't think like you got to go with Trey. The bar is very yeah. low for what we need from Trey Lance um, because it's not. It, this isn't a Justin Fields situation, in my opinion, where like Fields is probably going to have to scramble to get his rushing yards to where we want. We saw last year the design rushing yards like that. The reason I think that's so, so important is because it shows Shanahan's level of buy in. He's actually designing an offense around Lance uh, that's going to accentuate his ability to run. So, um, in terms of what he has to do as a passer, the bar is pretty low. Kyle, to your point, I'm not really taking a big stand on who it's going to be. I think, you know, he's going to support somebody, you know, for, for some weeks. So, I'm overweight Kittle, I'm overweight Ayuk, I'm overweight Samuel. I have 8% of Juwan Jennings, who doesn't get drafted a lot. Uh, uh, I, I have a bunch of Tyrion Davis Price. I've got, I'm overweight slightly, Elijah Mitchell. So, like, I've got a bunch of Lance. I currently have 26% Lance. Uh, and I'm throwing, I'm throwing them all in the stew, man. Not all in the same draft, but like, get me, get me some 49ers. I don't really have a strong, strong take. I even have 2% Danny Gray. So, you're, you're mixing it up. 
Who? I know, I know who, but he's a who? more proverbial who. <laughs> Oh, proverbial. This is apparently the, the yeah. connection with Jennings in camp has has been. Uh, oh, good, so. awesome, dude. That's great. Good. I'm glad to this hear. Is it. It's important that we know this. Reference to Kyle's comment earlier. If you're sick, that would that would we find. Yeah. Oh, this is you reason. are diseased. If you were thinking oh, about no. these, Danny Gray's and Jawan Jennings. <laughs> I'm I'm assuming based on everything we just heard that uh, Kyle the by the time we get to the old fantasy football expo just over a month from now the hype machine is going to be going full tilt on Trey Lance. Would you agree with that? statement yeah i totally agree that like if you're just looking for like closing line value essentially on players he's like one of the easier targets to take and that fantasy football expo i just mentioned is as you may have heard coming up august 12th to 14th in canton ohio nbc sports edge is a sponsor if you want to learn more about that go to the fantasy expo.com and the promo code nbc pass gives you 20 percent off all of the packages we have three more players we're targeting in every draft coming up first we're going to take a quick break just a reminder, if you don't have the NBC Sports Predictor app powered by PointsBet, go download it now. The contests are free and easy to play, and you have a shot to win thousands by predicting what will happen in Major League Baseball, on the PGA Tour, and NASCAR Circuit. We also have a special contest on Tuesdays and Thursdays called Battle of the Bets, where you can agree or disagree with our experts for a shot to collect some cash. And who does not like that? Uh, player number two for you, Lawrence. Hit us with it. Yeah, uh, my second player is one of the guys along with two is why it's because I'd be wanting to put Trey Lance into my top 12, but Derek Carr is one of the guys that doesn't make me do it. Uh, I think he do for a bounce back. Um, the Raiders, they went through a lot last year. Mm-hmm. The tragedy surrounding Henry Ruggs, John Gruden um, get fired. One is teammates acting silly on Instagram. They cut him. Um, Brian Edwards is one of your starting receivers. You got the 28 uh, worst line in football, according to pro football focus. Derek Carr took this team in the playoffs. Now finishing as a quarterback, uh, 16 on the points per game average. That's nothing to like, (laughs) I'm certainly not going to use that as my selling point. Um, but I will use uh, Devontae Adams and uh, Josh McDaniels and him bringing his offense here uh, or there, rather, to uh, Las Vegas. Darren Waller, was he missed six games last year. Mm -hmm. Um, You get him back healthy. But what that allowed him to do was build up a strong rapport with Hunter Renfro that he he ended up turning to a great uh, fantasy asset, got himself some money, too, straight balling. Um, so he's got like, I mean, when you talk about, uh, you, it, we talk about a guy who at one point played at an MVP level, uh, before going out with an injury. Um, I'm looking for him to get a- around that top 10, uh, fantasy quarterback, uh, finish, uh, when we talk in, uh, redraft and we talk about Devonte Adams, Hunter Renfro and Darren Waller, um, I don't, they're up there as far as receiving groups when you add the tight end in it. Probably the best one when you add the tight end with it. Um, receiver, even receiver duos, you could argue that Devontae Adams and Hunter Renfro is top five or six there together. Um, so you get that um, with Derek Carr, who he will certainly, I, I would bet my last or almost my last dollar that he will improve on his 23 to 14 interception ratio, yeah. which is a weird number seeing as how he threw for 4,800 yards. So with all that said, man, I'm just looking for him to have a great season. So I'm scooping Lamar in the fifth round, right? I'm going to go ahead and get that out the way. Then when I get to my second quarterback, I'm taking Derek Carr. Uh, I have a question. I the stat courtesy of uh, Jake Tribby on Twitter. Uh, I love it. It makes me laugh. Anyone have an idea how many 25 plus point games Derek Carr has in the past three seasons, 2019, 2020, and 21. Anyway, throw out a guess, throw out a number, you know, 25 points, not a huge bar to clear, but a good fantasy game, a, a really good, you know, anyone take a guess. Three. The last three, uh, is that what you said? Eight. Three. Uh, eight eight would say- seem reasonable for a guy who starts most games and he's a pretty good quarterback. I'm going price is right. One dollar. One, one big game. One. That is wow. so little. Wow. And he is a good quarterback. 
But to the extent that he is a threat to throw for 400 yards or four touchdowns or rush for more than 30 yards or score, like, I like... That's crazy. I, I, I was going to say I like his weapons. I really don't find myself getting a ton of them, though that might just be a personal leak. But, like, for me, Carr is not the way I'd be buying into this offense. I, I just... It's been three years of nothing but middling fantasy performances and you're just drawing dead to ever like, you know, imagine showing up to week 17, you have Derek Carr and the guy opposed to you has John Allen. Has Trey Lance. Yeah, he has Trey Lance. Oh my God, this is perfect. It comes full circle. Lawrence has coasted on 18 performances, 18 point performances from Derek Carr, a consistent 18 points. <laughs> and this points. is where I suffer. And it's Trey Lance suffer, makes man. Week 17 correlation. Your Raiders go off and just pushes Lance to throw, baby. Oh right. shoot! They actually play each other. You're right. They play each other. Yeah. I, so I, I have been taking the Raiders a fair amount, but I, then I go, then I tackle on Lance to get that Week 17 correlation and and uh, bring a, a 49er along. But the issue that I have with Carr is the offensive line. They blew up the offensive line last year. Uh, wasn't good, and they they added a third rounder and like nothing else. So the offensive line is is not probably going to be good. Looking at projections. Mike Renner has them as the 29th overall on uh, in a tier called problematic. Seems fitting. Uh, and Justin Edwards uh, has them as 26th. Uh, so that is a concern to me. Like if we're if we're hoping they're going to be that because I I think for Carr to really pay off, um, they're going to need to like be really pass first and kind of blossom into you know the type of team that can make the AFC West just this incredibly fun division. But I do worry about like it being hit or miss when they're forced to go to the air a bunch doing so with a really poor offensive line. I, I will say I, on, on the positive side, I mean, I do see the point of for a guy who threw for 4,800 yards last season, 23 touchdowns is a weirdly low number. And yeah. so maybe a little positive regression, it wouldn't take a lot for a car to, you know, to, to make a leap. And I'm still I'm still trying to wrap my head around Kyle's stat the, the Kyle the stat that not Kyle my stat cited, to be fair. someone else pulled it yeah, I just like yeah it. The, the stat that you cited from the, yeah, yeah, the I user it. of Twitter that you mentioned I think yeah. that's the upside scenario is that last year they were a relatively even pace team and they were super pass heavy and though recently the Patriots under uh, I keep I, I always say Mike McDaniel or Josh McDaniel I never say the right one under Josh McDaniel have been generally run heavy they've had a rookie quarterback in Cam Noon during the the Brady years they were unsurprisingly pass heavy and though Derek Carr's not Brady he does have a really good cast of weapons so if you do get that very comfortable playing pass heavy reasonable pace with good receivers and then the touchdown uh, regression hits and maybe he has a good season in terms he runs above expectation and touchdowns it's a lot of attempts a lot of volume like you said we weren't far from a 5,000 yard Derek Carr season that seems crazy mm -hmm. uh, but if you get good touchdown luck on that type of volume it could really be a big season uh, it's just not something I'd be like betting on yeah, and, just wish he was a little cheaper. And better. Yeah. And the thing too is, you know, Josh uh Josh Jacobs coming off his uh lowest rushing total of his career. They didn't pick up uh, you know, they didn't pick up his fifth year option. So that's another thing um I I attribute to that. So I'm just I'm pretty much banging on look, you got Devontae Adams now. You you was already gonna have a solid receiving group. You didn't just get any receiver. You got arguably the best one. So it 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 has to work. You know what I'm saying? And, and again, they had a whole bunch of other stuff going on. They they're gonna get it right. And, and speaking from a team perspective, I don't think they should be counted out of the AFC West. Many people are. Many people are acting like they're not the team who knocked out the Chargers with. Hot shot Justin Herbert. Those Raiders with those minimal 25-point fantasy games from Derek Carr, they beat them. <laughs> the Raiders are not – they're going to – they're going to be – they're going to duke it. It's going to be – a lot of people say it might be three teams out the AFC West. Well, one of them could be the Raiders. So, I mean, to the touchdown point as well, like Devontae Adams and Derek Carr, they played together in college. There was a video, a highlight video of Devontae Adams when he was coming out in 2014 that I watched probably a hundred times. I was like so psyched about Devontae Adams coming out. It looked really, it was a really bad opinion for like three years, but eventually, it eventually got there. But like they, I mean, it wasn't just that they had a, a great connection. They had a great 
touchdown connection. Devontae Adams scored a ton of touchdowns in college. So that I think could have a really big impact um, specifically with the thing that, that he didn't do last year, score touchdowns. Yeah. All right. Player number five, Kyle, your second and final player of the afternoon is dot, dot, dot. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you for letting me say Tyler Lockett's name. And it's it's not that I want to be buying into the Seahawks offense. Uh, we now have no shot at landing Baker Mayfield, which wasn't that great of an outcome anyways, but it probably would have been better than Drew Lock and Geno Smith. But mm. I think for me, it's more of people are like, this offense can be bad, but that could possibly lead to them throwing a lot. And more importantly, we are giving DK Metcalf a large portion of the offense. If you look at their ADPs, he's going just inside the top 50. Tyler Lockett goes basically 50 picks after him on underdog. And I don't know if I buy that there's that much of a difference between them in terms of their actual production. Look, I have watched both of them play, and I understand that one of them is small, fun, speedy Tyler Lockett, and one of them, uh, you know, is like Adonis of football. I get that DK Metcalf looks big and strong and fun, but the difference in their market shares last year was essentially nothing, right? Tyler Lockett had a 2% edge in air yards. DK Metcalf had a 3% edge in target share. Tyler Lockett was actually more efficient in yards per route run. The year before that, DK Metcalf was the deep threat, but he actually saw fewer targets in terms of target share than Tyler Lockett. I don't think they're that different if you are projecting them, right? Does one player have an immense ceiling that maybe Tyler Lockett doesn't have? Sure, I think DK Metcalf, if you had to give me a receiver to put on my franchise today, I would take him. But in fantasy drafts, am I taking him 50 picks ahead of Tyler Lockett when over the past two years, they've basically flip-flopped in terms of air yards and target share. And then three years ago, which it was DK Metcalf's first year, I don't count it too heavily, but Tyler Lockett kind of boat raced him in all, all sort of market share stats. So do I think there's that much of a difference? No, but drafters are really confident as DK Metcalf, really confident. Mm-hmm. I'm confident but- DK Metcalf. <laughs> you um, are? I will take him 50 spots over Tyler Lockett. But if I didn't get DK Metcalf those 50 spots ahead of Tyler Lockett, I would mess with Tyler Lockett too and feel decent about it. Um, DK Metcalf had a bad year last year and had 975 yards and 12 touchdowns. I just think that's wild. Um, but I ain't against I ain't against Tyler Lockett either, though. Again, you you when it all said and done, like you said, you probably getting a better value there. Um I'm just caught into the big, strong, fast dude, like you said. I get it. I get it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, DK Metcalf is, is way more fun to draft than Lockett. And I agree with you, Kyle, that the gap shouldn't be that big. But, like, it's one of those things where I want someone else to fix it. Like, someone else <laughs> fix the scene. I don't want to have to fix it. <laughs> right. uh, the other this thing is, is – This is bad. The other thing is, uh, it could be I am presenting a false dichotomy of like, why are you drafting DK Metcalf when you should draft Tyler Lockett? There is a very real chance that both these players are overpriced. This offense is absolutely dreadful. They shouldn't have a good line. Uh They won't have a good quarterback. They don't have smart play calling. Like, I'm simply saying that there is volume on all teams to be had, and I think Tyler Lockett is underpriced on that. But if we end the year and this offense really just doesn't produce any like receivers that are worth their cost, honestly wouldn't surprise me. There's kind of a list of guys that I – uh, I, I haven't actually made this list, but it's like in my head of guys that I will probably be drafting a lot more of in September that I'm mm-hmm. not drafting a lot of now. And that list does include Lockett, includes guys like Brandon Cooks, where it's like it's very hard for me to imagine, especially now that Baker's not going to Seattle, like what scenarios which would lead to Lockett like really jumping up a lot in ADP. And I'm also doing a lot more zero running back starts than I will be later in the year. So like like the safe veteran wide receiver option who's not going to get steamed um it's just less appealing to me right now but i do agree that like he's probably mispriced uh especially when you look at at dk mecca geno smith started three games i believe um lockett was quiet in the first two of those then exploded for a 12 catch 142 yard game on 13 targets week eight against jacksonville i don't know what's like of that what's that <laughs> Yeah. Sounds like him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Knowing Tyler Lockett, that timeline checks out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at least he showed – it was only one game. At least he showed he is capable of hitting that ceiling with Geno back there. But it's it's a scary proposition. I get it. Um, number six, final player of the day in Karain. This is you in a controversial turn of events. Right before air, you made a late switch. Uh, tell us about it. I did make a late switch. Uh, originally, I was going to talk about Isaiah McKenzie, who I'm – 
I'm, I'm, I'm drafting, but I was like, you know, I'm not actually drafting him as much as, uh, you know, Danny I should Gray. be for this for this segment. <laughs> yeah, for, you know, he's no Danny Gray. Uh, he's no yeah. Will Fuller is really what it comes down to. He's no Julio Jones, who I've drafted uh, an embarrassing amount of. So I figured I should take a guy who I'm, like, actively targeting in drafts all the time right now, and that's Rashad White. Uh, partially because my Rojo exposure got a, got a little hefty there. And uh, if you're looking to, to even things out, I'm like, wh- who's a guy that I could actually, like, have to have? And as much as I like Rojo in this Chiefs offense, as I said before, even if things break right for him, he's going to be splitting a backfield. If things break right, and it would probably take a, a Leonard Fournette injury for this to be the case, but if, you know, the contingent value argument for White is just so much stronger – where he could be like a a real workhorse from a fantasy football perspective. He's not going to like be like you know getting all these all these carries, but kind of like um you know could could he emerge as a sort of Alvin Kamara type of workload as a rookie if something were to happen to Fournette? I think he absolutely mm-hmm. could. He's got this incredible receiving profile coming out uh, from Greg Allman's interview on a football show, mentioning that he thinks. This is not a Keyshawn Vaughn situation. He considers him already the number two back ahead of Giovanni mm-hmm. Bernard, which is a big deal because if Thank Giovanni you. Bernard is ahead of him as a veteran, as a trusted veteran, then the path for White is much more difficult. But if White is already the number two in on this team, that is huge, not just because he's next in line if something happens for to Fournette, right. but Tom Brady throws to his running backs on all downs. He – through to to Ronald Jones. Ronald Jones had a nine target game in 2020. Ronald Jones was targeted Please, nine times real. in a professional football game and he in 2020. <laughs> and he got two of them. Yeah. So I mean you're looking at you're looking at a guy who's actually got a receiving skill set who's going to be able to I think siphon away some of that work from Leonard Fournette. Again, because he doesn't have to come in on third downs. He doesn't have to be out there in blocking situations. He can be out there on first down. He can be getting screens. In addition to that nine target game, Jones had a five target game. He had three, four target games. He had a three target game all in 2020. Even last year when Jones was basically phased out of the offense entirely, he still had two, three target games. Uh, His highest snap share of the season was 54%. Uh, He had a 53% snap share game where he got three targets. In week 16, when the Bucs were like, completely out on Jones, he still got a three-target game because Tom Brady throws his running backs. So uh, I think, you know, Rashad White with this receiving skill set, very athletic, good draft capital, third-round pick. Um, I think he's got a chance to immediately contribute more than people are really giving him credit for uh, with some of this early down work. And then this, the contingent value is just really off the charts. Yeah, yeah. I like that. I, I, I wanted to – pour some cold water on this. Now I'm like more hyped up even like always like try and present, uh, you know, both sides I'm trying to be real centrist here. I wanted to present some sort of counter argument, but like, I, I feel good about that. And you look where he goes. You don't have to pay this extreme. You don't have to pay the Tony Pollard premium, right? But like, could he have the Tony Pollard profile? He certainly has the pass catching profile that we sort of praise Tony Pollard for. Uh, and he's not like, he's not like as a five, 970 pound guy, right? He, he actually has, like you say, it doesn't have to be all three downs, hundred percent of the snaps. But he has the profile of a guy who can take the snaps we care about, which is basically what Leonard Fournette does. Leonard Fournette doesn't get 26 carries a game. He doesn't have to. He gets goal line work and he gets tons of targets. That's all that matters. And the contingent value alone puts him perfectly in line with someone going like uh, eight, you know, eight picks after him, Daryl Henderson. Except Daryl Henderson probably isn't like that good. He goes out, he gets his carries, gets some targets, and isn't going to provide a ton on top of that. You're just there to, to basically get the work that's given to you. White could be a, a surplus player who gives you more uh, on top of the, the volume he gets just for the contingent value alone. And there's some small chance that he gives you some pop-up weeks where just five catches, 30 yards, and he maybe scores a touchdown as just the number two to, to Leonard Fournette. So I, I'm all in on this. Yeah, I'm going to make this uh, pretty quick. Uh, yeah, give me Rashad White easily over a guy like Daryl Henderson. He's had uh-huh. enough time to show us. Um, best ball, love Rashad White. Um, redraft, you know, it's straight up like handcuffing could provide some standalone value. Uh, like you say, just simply getting reps in the game, like Leonard Fournette, I still expect him to be in that definitely start out as one of the better fantasy options. Um, but 
if if this dude is off the rip, the second running back behind him in a Tom Brady offense, like you're valuable there. Um, so I'm all I'm I'm all with that, man. I'm glad you didn't talk about Isaiah McKenzie because I had yeah. some, <laughs> I had some for you then. <laughs> yeah, Karain, really glad you made that switch. That was a a, a nice. I am nice too. I, I didn't know I avoided a landmine there. Uh, one other stat here on Rashad White, just just how good his receiving profile was. Um, I, again, with size, he's not a tiny guy. He can actually handle uh, a decent workload, kind of a Camara s workload, I think. But he had 2.59 career yards per route run. Uh, day one and two picks to have at least 2.2 yards per route run over their career. Christian McCaffrey, David Johnson, Kenyon Drake, Alvin Kamara, Joe Mixon, Antonio Gibson, and Rashad White. He might be pretty good. He, there's a chance he's very, very good at the receiving portion of this. Paired with Tom Brady, it's just hard for me not to draft him. I, I got a little panicky when I saw the, the gap between him and Ronald Jones and decided I need to correct it. Full circle. First of all, full circle back to Ronald Jones. I like it. Uh, all right, that's the end of the list for now. Uh, before we go, guys, anything you would like to mention on NBC Sports Edge that you have coming up or have already hit the publish button on? Best ball tiers dropping every Wednesday. Quarterbacks and running backs are already out. I will be updating those throughout the summer. I actually have to update uh, the ones for the quarterback today. So that'll be live by the time you hear the show eventually. And uh, – Colts team previews came out. Dolphins is next. And even for the people who aren't on the show, tons of great team previews uh, coming out. So check out everyone else's as well, not just mine. Just check out mine. No, just <laughs> <that. laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically what he said, man, the fantasy previews, we got the names coming every single day, you know, all up until uh, training camp, basically, man. So uh, get at us. I'll be back on uh, this show, Good Football Show, on Monday, talking to NFC North with uh, with Rotor. All right. Going to be previewing that division. All right. Look out for all of that. That's going to do it for us. Don't forget to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, wherever you listen. Take a minute to rate and review us as well. We would appreciate that. I want to say thanks to everyone for listening and watching live. And thanks to you guys, Lawrence, Karain, Kyle. Appreciate it. We'll see you next week. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.